Yes, nothing, uh, nothing to make you feel uh, as old as realizing that not only were you a research assistant, but it was 31 years ago <laughs> for Steve Hess, who's still here. Um, so, uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for uh, having us and hosting this discussion. Um, I really uh, want to thank Mark, Muro, Bruce, uh, Katz, and, and of course Amy for uh, uh, hosting us. I've been working with Amy and, and Bruce for many, many years and, and very happy to, to be part of their uh, form here. Uh, and I think, you know, with James and Marty and Rebecca, you have a, a, just an all-star panel. Uh, I obviously just want to start by, you know, thanking some you know, other people in our administration, Alan Kruger, Jim Stock, Mark Dom, Sue Helper, uh, J.J. Rayner, who, uh, you know, were helpful in, in our work on this. And most of all, I want to thank my, my real, our real right-hand person, uh, Jason Miller, who uh, uh, is really, I think, uh, um, one of the stars in manufacturing policy uh, in this country. Uh, and we're very uh, privileged to have him at the National Economic Council with us. So. Um, uh, as you've heard, the president is going to be uh, delivering a series of uh, economic uh, addresses uh, over the next several weeks, uh, making the case that our North Star for economic policy is do we have a growing economy that strengthens as opposed to hollows out the middle class? Uh, and that is, uh, that will be very much the subject uh, of the speeches he, he gave. And as you saw yesterday in the framing speech, he starts by asking the question of what do we need to do to make the United States a magnet uh, for middle class jobs? What do we need to do to expand our uh, new competitive edge for location uh, uh, for uh, durable, strong jobs of the future? Um, and, uh, and as he is talking more over the next uh, several weeks, there's no question that he will make the case for uh, our uh, manufacturing policy. And so I'm very happy that uh, I could have the opportunity today to maybe go a little bit more in depth uh, and make the case for the potential of a manufacturing uh, renaissance. Uh, you know, as, uh, as Amy said, um, you know, again, there's a little question that President Obama has made this a key plank of that middle class and innovation and competitiveness agenda. And there's also a little question, nobody really doubts that manufacturing has been a bright spot in the economy. The 500,000 jobs since 2010 is the most we've seen since the 1990s. Uh, but I think as Amy mentioned, you know, people uh, do raise the issue of, uh, you know, is a focus on manufacturing appropriate public policy? Uh, is it really promising in light of globalization and technology trends? Uh, uh, and is, the, is what we're seeing in the last couple of years just a normal cyclical recovery uh, that doesn't represent any structural or competitive advantage for the United States? And I guess I wanted to start by saying that I think that we uh, do better in, uh, y y we, we view these issues through a more insightful lens if I think we kind of get the paradigm questions correct. And I think sometimes they are framed in a way that leads us in a, the wrong direction. So first, and so let me mention three ways I would uh, uh, shift the paradigm in which we ask these questions. First. Uh, we need to stop asking or thinking about the promise of advanced manufacturing from an industrial policy perspective in which we ask, are we trying to pick winners and losers, to seeing the justification for this as a more of an innovation spillover model, where we are, as is appropriate in economic policy, asking, does, the, does manufacturing location in the United States lead to the kind of positive and, innov and innovation spillover benefits that benefit the economy and particular communities as, as a whole beyond what any single private sector actor can capture. 
And the second uh, paradigm shift is that I think we need to stop looking at the jobs question from the large factory paradigm, uh, which leads people to talk about whether they are large silent factories, to a manufacturing jobs perspective that looks at a supply chain paradigm, which recognizes that manufacturing and service jobs uh, are uh, impacted across integrated supply chains. And third, going to the issue of renaissance, I think we need to shift from having a static snapshot analysis of where we are to a dynamic analysis, which asks the right question, which is, is a manufacturing renaissance possible if we are implementing the right policies that put more wind at the back of positive economic trends? So having uh, framed those three paradigms, let me, let me go at them then. So the first is um, uh, uh, on the seeing this from an innovation spillover model as opposed to industrial policy. Now, the absolute standard critique uh, that you do get from some, though I won't say most or all economists, is just that manufacturing, if you're, if you're stressing manufacturing, you must be engaged in some kind of misguided industrial policy in which you think the government is somehow better at picking winners than uh, millions of uh, investors in a competitive market. And therefore, you're just by definition going to lead to distortion and deadweight loss in the economy. Now, if this was what we were doing, I would lead the charge against it. Uh, because I don't support that type of picking winners and losers. And anybody who looked at my, uh, you know, in, in, in my book, The Pro-Growth Progressive, I, I tell, in fact, an anecdote uh, uh, and of how top government economists in 1992-93 predicted travel agents would be one of the top ten growing jobs in the United States. Um, and, and they were not wrong based on what they were looking at in terms of demographics and more upper middle class people in retirement. You know, they just missed that little uh, internet thing. Um, but I think that's t that, is, that is a humbling reminder for all of us. But it has never been the purpose or motivation of the president, his economic team, or the economist CEOs and university presidents, some of who are part of our advanced manufacturing part partnership, uh, it has never been their motivation or purpose to be engaged in that type of picking winners and losers. Uh, I think that the type of rationale that, I mean, so first of all, nothing that we're doing is going out trying to pick one industry over another, bet on a particular, you know, this isn't the graduate where, you know, we're you know, whispering into Dustin Hoffman's ear, plastics. Um, uh, I dated myself there, yes. Um, I told you it's been 31 years since I was a research assistant, so I'd already dated myself. Um, but I think the, the, the paradigm, which is better to think about this, is research and development. I mean, we have a pr pretty wide bipartisan consensus that, uh, that it makes sense for us to encourage research and development on our shores. Uh, the R&D tax credit requires you to basically be located here. And we do that not because we're trying to pick a particular industry, but because we do believe that research has spillover benefits to the economy as a whole, that if we do not have policy to encourage, we will underinvest. And our case for manufacturing is really in that R&D innovation spillover benefit. We think that there is a general case that having particularly more advanced manufacturing located in the United States has a broader innovation spillover benefit that goes beyond the private actors involved and that justifies a public policy uh, uh, orientation promoting that. So let me just give a, a, you know, a few of the, the arguments for the innovation uh, uh, spillover model. One, uh, manufacturing does punch above its weight. Yes, it is only 12% of GDP, but it represents 70% of private sector R&D. So if we think our, it represents 60% of all U.S. R&D employees, 90% of patent issued, issued, and the majority of U.S. exports. So manufacturing punches above its weight in areas that we usually agree have larger benefits uh, uh, for the economy. 
Um, secondly, uh, a lot of research, and some done by people who have uh, traveled through here, have shown that manufacturing generates spillover benefits to the location and to the country in which the activity occurs. A 2010 study by uh, Mr. Greenstone, and many of you know, Hornbeck and Moretti, showed that as a result of a manufacturing plant moving into the community, the productivity of the surrounding plants improved 12%. Now remember, the model in a, like just a market share mode might be that the competitor or someone else gets worse, worse off. But they show when you come in, there are what they call agglomeration spillovers that end up making the surrounding firms 12% uh, 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 more productive. Wolfgang Keller examined R&D in 14 countries over 25 years and found that the spillover benefits from that activity decline with distance by more than 50% when they are 700 miles away. So location and proximity matters to the spillover effects. Lee Brandstetter, who many of you know, investigated the benefits of manufacturing in the US and Japan and found that the knowledge and productivity spillovers tend to be intranational, intranational, are captured in the country where the activity occurs, making location critical to capturing those benefits. All of that justifies from a public policy point of view, a uh, orientation to increase this type of, of, of activity that has such significant innovation spillovers. Third, the pro proximity of production and design. I think there is a growing body of literature that examines the importance of proximity between the actual manufacturing activity and the design activity. That's because for many technologies, the capabilities gained in production are intertwined with the new learning and the knowledge activities of research and development and design. And uh, Marty's from MIT, and, and they have done in their PI program a lot of work, and, and one of the quotes from their report is, quote, learning takes place as engineers and technicians on the factory floor come back with their problems to the design engineers and struggle with them to find better solution. Learning takes place as users come back with problems. This iterative innovation process connecting manufacturing and design is how a wide range of so-called breakthrough technologies came to pass. Uh, in advanced materials, it took years of lab and shop iteration for DuPont to develop the science and the incremental process improvements to produce a true breakthrough product like Kevlar. Uh, it is the reason why Bell Labs, you know, the, the, the source of so much innovation in the 20th century, uh, talks specifically at, quote, housing thinkers and doers under one roof. It's the reason why Boeing moved its engineer to the production floor and why many credit Intel's decision to locate its chip manufacturing near its design facilities in the US with their te current technology lead. It is also this understanding that underpins the president's flagship initiative to create a national network of manufacturing institutes, connecting businesses, universities, and federal agencies to co-invest in world-leaning capabilities. These institutions rely on the complementary activities between production and design to encourage manufacturing location in an area or a particular region. And it is why former MIT President Susan Hockfield noted that the loss of manufacturing, quote, not only destroys manufacturing jobs, but saps our inventive advantage. Next, issue, next element of this innovation spillover is what I think some have called the industrial commons or the, the strength of the, uh, of the supply chain uh, 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 ecosystem. Um, that ecosystem that develops around the intersection of innovation and production does tend to be complex. Manufacturers established and emerging depend on dense network of suppliers, high skilled talent capabilities. These often take years to develop, uh, uh, and when they are lost, uh, uh, it, it, is, it is a much more significant loss to the community and that potential for future competitiveness than than can be sought by looking at any particular actor. Harvard professors Pisano and she have observed existing manufacturing capabilities provide what they call the quote, industrial commons or the R&D and manufacturing infrastructure know-how process development and engineering in firms, universities and other organizations that provide the foundation for growth and innovation in a wide range of industries. 
when we allow our manufacturing base to erode, we lose those capabilities and we create a vicious cycle that risks the health of our manufacturing sector and the services that depend on it today. Now, again, justifying the public policy rationale, from the perspective of a single firm, the decision to move production elsewhere can make economic sense. But the result of several individual firms doing that can have a cascading effect on customers and suppliers within this dense network within which manufacturing operates. And so for the next firm, the economics are then a little more favorable to moving and a little less favorable to expanding here. As a result of this dynamic, these cascading decisions can create a vicious cycle, making the U.S. less attractive as a location for manufacturing, and we lose the capacity to compete for the next industries. When we're doing things like the manufacturing innovation hubs, we are create, making it more attractive to come and less attractive uh, to leave. Now, what Pisano and she highlight is the case of consumer electronics in their book, Producing Prosperity. And they kind of say, well, you know, it might have made sense to seem like electronics capacity relocated largely to Asia, that it did, may not have seemed that it would have detrimental impacts in the future. But their point is that it led to the loss of production capabilities when we started moving to the more advanced technologies like advanced batteries, LED, lighting, fiber optics, and flat panel displays. And as MIT report stated, as a result of this loss of production and its impact across the industrial commons, quote, across the entire industrial landscape, there are now gaping holes and missing pieces. Uh, so it's not just what happens in that static moment. It's what it does to our capacity to compete for the next round of innovation, which we as a country should care about. And it is something that in the defense industry they are very aware of, that you can't just, when a, a, a particular weapon system becomes obsolete, that if you simply allow all that lost capacity, you can say that's okay because that weapon's obsolete. But if you lose that completely, you lose the ability to have the skill component, the supply side component, to conquer the next element that we may need for our military readiness. Now, rebuilding and strengthening these ecosystem is a critical part of the strength of existing industries and the formation of new ones. Um, uh, you've seen this in a recent study in Delgado, Porter, and Stern. Uh, 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 that talk about uh, uh, how the shared expertise not only led to faster employment growth in those industries, but faster growth of new industries, 45% faster. But I guess if consumer electronics is the case of where we let the supply chain erode and lost our ability to compete as well as we might have, uh, then the auto industry provides the counterexample. At the time the president took office, GM and Chrysler were obviously on the brink uh, of failure. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the thing that's most interesting and was a teaching moment was that this was never just about GM and Chrysler. It was about the positive or negative impact it would have throughout the supply base. Uh, like many industries, automakers have shared supply chains, and these suppliers not only make up the majority of the value added in the vehicle, but they are critical to new innovation and competitiveness. The loss of the supply base triggered by the failures of GM and Chrysler could not only have cost hundreds of thousands of jobs in the middle of a deep recession, but they, it could have led us to cede our claim to be competing uh, for the advanced vehicles, advanced batteries of the future. And, I, you know, if there was one quote I would focus on that I think is so telling, it is uh, the comment of Ford CEO Alan Mullally concerning the federal efforts to rescue his main competitors. Uh, now, if we were probably, many of you, if you were teaching an intro business or economics class, you might say, if you have three big competitors... And, G and two of them are going to go down, that's going to be good for the third competitor. They're going to be able to seize more market share. But Mullally uh, actually ends up supporting the rescue of his two competitors precisely because they so understand this uh, industrial commons supply chain 
uh, competitiveness. And Mullaly, when he testifies uh, as to why Ford supported that, uh, the, the rescue says, we believed, quote, we believed that if GM and Chrysler would have gone into free fall bankruptcy, they would have taken down the supply base and taken the industry down, plus maybe turned the US recession into a depression. That is a fairly insightful moment in thinking about a different paradigm for manufacturing. So the second thing I said was that shifting from the large factory perspective to the supply side perspective, that leads nicely into that. I hear that a lot. You know, when you go to a big factory, it seems awfully quiet. Perhaps this suggests this is not uh, the avenue uh, 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 for job creation. I also hear that well, manufacturing jobs are just in inevitable decline. And I want to take on both of those. I'll do the first quickly. In the myth of inevitable decline on jobs, just so we know, of course, in every advanced country, manufacturing has less jobs as a percentage of GDP and less, uh, is less share of GDP than it was decades ago. That's true for any advanced country. But it is not the case that in absolute numbers, there's been a steady decline. That's just not the case. In 1965, the manufacturing sector employed 17 and a half million Americans. When I left the Clinton administration in 2000, uh, the manufacturing sector employed 17 and a half million workers. It went up and down. It had, was not an inevitable decline. It was just last decade where we saw a dramatic loss, particularly uh, uh, before the Great Recession, uh, even more so than during the Great Recession. Uh, from 65 to 2000, we steadily grew manufacturing production at 4% annum. It was only from 2000 to 2010 where production uh, uh, underperformed the economy. I will leave to another day analyzing you know, what might have gone wrong in trade enforcement and focus on manufacturing in the last decade. But I do want to just note that, it, that this inevitable decline is stated often without actually looking at the numbers. And it is also the case that other advanced countries, while they have shrunk, uh, uh, they would not necessarily have lost, we would not, not necessarily lost as many jobs as we did. If the US rate of decline followed the rate of the German decline over this period, there would be five million more jobs. And William Nordhaus, as you know, has done research that Brookings then extended into 2009 that showed that there was not a connection between increased productivity and loss of jobs in the manufacturing industry from 48 to 2003, and Brookings scholars checked that and extended it to 2009. So when you're looking for jobs, we need to look not at, at, at the large factory focus, but the supply chain uh, uh, focus. Uh, the McKinsey Global Institute, and I'm sure this is uh, uh, James Minika's work, who you will talk to, estimated that there are another 5.7 million jobs in integrated manufacturing supply chains that are often not counted. Uh, decades ago, they would have been count they would have been in-house and counted, but today, when a company uses an outsourced transportation fleet or software design firm, they end up not being counted. Uh, Enrico Moretti suggests that on average a manufacturing job supports 1.6 jobs outside of manufacturing and when it's advanced manufacturing, nearly five jobs across uh, uh, the uh, broader economy. Um, third, even the silent factory fails to envision the connection between high wage services and high wage manufacturing. Uh, jobs developing software, services, and apps using uh, sophisticated electronics in areas like the Boeing 787 Dreamline, now embedded in products from cars to microwaves. And even in Michigan today, the fastest growing technical jobs are software system and application developers growing three to four times as technical occupations, largely because of demand for programmers who can build new software application for automobiles. So again, uh, uh, when we look from the supply chain, uh, perspective instead of the big factory perspective, the case for manufacturing jobs, again, becomes stronger when you have the appropriate broader vision through the supply chain and the jobs that support or are interconnected with manufacturing, whether they are technically counted in the manufacturing sector or not. 
And then, and then the final perspective was on this renaissance issue. Now, I think that, you know, just to do the brief history over the last several months, I think probably myself and others used the phrase renaissance, and I think a couple of very, uh, uh, you know, reputable and, and very talented economists uh, at uh, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley put out reports that were reported as questioning whether a renaissance uh, uh, in fact had taken place. And I think we want to, I want to take this on in two levels. One, you know, mostly what I want to say is that from a public policy question, a snapshot perspective is not the right perspective. You know, I mean, if you're, uh, 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 what you want to know is if we do the right policies in a dynamic process, can we have a renaissance? Is this possible? Is the wind blowing at our back in a way that it makes sense that if we laid the right foundation that we could achieve a lasting renaissance in manufacturing? That is really the only relevant public policy question. Taking a snapshot at this moment and saying, looking at facts at this second, are we there or not there, is an interesting question, but it is not the determinative or most important question from a public policy perspective. Now, uh, uh, the first thing I want to say a little bit is that uh, uh, I don't even necessarily think that uh, the snapshot view they took was particularly correct, or at least in the way it was interpreted. Uh, let me make a couple of comments about that. Um, one, um, uh, uh, that was read by some as saying everything we're seeing right now is just kind of cyclical, has no policy connection. Well, that's kind of uh, wrong on its face. I mean, that ignores completely the role of the auto rescue. Uh, remember the Bush CA had projected we were going to lose one million jobs if GM and Chrysler were to fail? The auto industry has added 325,000 jobs instead of losing a million since GM and Chrysler emerged from bankruptcy. So first of all, any thought that, that the strength of manufacturing is somehow cyclical, non-connected to public policy, is wrong on its face once you recognize the role of auto jobs and the auto policies. Secondly, the Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley pieces were just not as negative as they were reported. I mean, they expressed skepticism of whether if you took a snapshot now, you could prove a renaissance. But Morgan Stanley acknowledges, and I quote, there is clear evidence that the draining of US manufacturing capacity into China has stopped. Similarly, Goldman stated that, quote, the outlook for the manufacturing sector is reasonably bright. Over the next few years, we expect US manufacturing to grow a bit faster than the economy as a whole. Well, if Goldman's predicting that manufacturing would grow a bit faster as a whole, if you added those three years to what we have there, that would be the longest period of manufacturing uh, uh, outperformance of the economy in a half century. So, uh, you know, one, I don't think they were quite as negative. But also, right now, the U.S. is increasing share of global exports. Uh, uh, Bridgewater, a court, you know, Bridgewater noted that the U.S. has gained global share at a faster pace than all major countries except China. And even as we've had the slowdown, that has remained true. Uh, Alan Kruger, uh, uh, our Council of Economic Advisors, and Jim Stock have done analysis and find significant amount of the job gains is structural, and they do that by adjusting and looking at previous recoveries as well. So I think, one, I, so one, I challenge that their snapshot is not a little fuzzy, but I also think it's the wrong perspective. The right question is, are there trends that suggest a potential for a manufacturing renaissance if we adopt the right policies? And I think the answer there is clearly, uh, is clearly yes. When the president did his insourcing form at, um, uh, in the beginning of 2012, uh, a CFO of a very major technology company said to the president, you know, Mr. President, it is true that in the last several years, we are now considering US location much more than we were. Uh, he said, but you have to understand, it's still a close, you know, that doesn't mean we come to the US, that means it's a close call now. What you do on R&D policy, on infrastructure, uh, on uh, uh, manufacturing, uh, how manufacturing is treated in the tax code, 
all of those could make the difference at the margin. How easy do you make it or hard do you make it to invest here? So policy matters. And I think that we have a reason to believe that policy would matter now more than maybe even last decade because I believe at this point we do have more of the win uh, at our back. And that analysis you know, did not start with the Obama administration or any political person. It really started with the major business consulting groups like McKinsey, like the Boston Consulting Group, who started telling clients that when you look at not the last 10 years, but the future 10 years, location in the U.S., particularly for manufacturing, is more competitive now. They did that by looking at the uh, uh, impact on wages and productivity. Uh, they do that by looking at uh, what's happened in terms of abundant low-cost energy uh, and U.S. natural gas prices and the potential competitive advantage that you have there. And I think there's been a greater recognition of the hidden cost of long supply chains, including logistic uncertainty and even natural disaster uh, uncertainty. All of these uh, um, uh, uh, have... Um, uh, I think, put us in a more competitive edge. Of manufacturing executives surveyed by Morgan Stanley, more than 50% listed supply chain shortening as a top reason why they chose to bring new production back to the United States. Uh, uh, a survey by the Boston Consulting Group last year found that nearly 50% of companies, 50% of companies with more than $10 billion in sales were actively considering relocating production from China to the U.S. Morgan Stanley's recent survey suggests that reshoring outlook is even more positive over the medium term, with more than 70% of, res of respondents predicting expansion in the U.S. over the next five years. So... Um, I will, I, I will just, uh, uh, I, I will stop briefly as opposed to going through all of our policies, but I think, you know, to recap, I think that when you look at the proper paradigm of innovation spillover, when you look at the supply chain jobs, and when you look at a dynamic analysis as opposed to a static analysis, there is every reason to believe it makes good sense to have a public policy perspective that pushes us to be more competitive in manufacturing and advanced manufacturing. And our agenda uh, is broad in that area. You know, it goes from uh, uh, making the U.S. more competitive by reforming the tax code. And, you know, in our plan, we would have the tax rate for manufacturing as low as 25 percent. Modernizing our infrastructure is absolutely a competitiveness and location issue, as the President of the United States is talking about today. Harnessing our natural gas and energy resources. All of these support the first plank of cost competitiveness. Second, spurring innovation through next generation technologies, encouraging the dynamic pro uh, advantage of location here. The President's proposal on manufacturing innovation institutes, his constant support for research in advanced manufacturing, advanced batteries, uh, in key technologies. Third, a real agenda about skills and community supply chains. Uh, we have uh, uh, proposals, significant skills proposal, community college to career fund proposals, manufacturing extension partnerships. We have a, a, a focus for $6 billion on community tax credits and a new, a new proposal in the State of the Union on investing in manufacturing communities partnerships to bring use to have all the agencies working together to help with strategic partnerships. Four, we do have to take trade enforcement serious. Serious, and I think it was a serious mistake of the previous administration not to use the Section 421 uh, with China in manufacturing. I think it sent a very important signal when the president came into office right away and did that in the tires case and kept uh, and was willing to take on the auto and auto parts zones in 2012 and make sure we have a level playing field. And then finally, um, uh, you know, we need a pillar where we are more active as a country in encouraging investment here. That's why we have a new Select USA initiative. That's why we'll have a new Select USA summit. Uh, that's why we are making clear through our policies and our action and our words that we want you to locate jobs in the United States. So uh, uh, I really appreciate a chance to come uh, uh, and be part of what's been a very good discussion and make the case for Manufacturing Renaissance, so thank you very much.
Uh, thank you so much, Jean. And uh, that was a very just robust, linear case for uh, manufacturing's promise matched by, I think, a similarly linear uh, agenda to support the manufacturing moment. I hope we can credit some of your Brookings research assistant skills uh, in that. Um, we do, uh, Jean has about uh, five, seven minutes maybe for s to take some questions. Um, I think what I'll do is call on two, two uh, questions at a time if there's a lot of interest. I do want to make sure, given our limited time, that we keep the questions focused on his remarks. Uh, no questions about the royal baby. Okay, so let's start here because your hand was up first and in the back. Thank you. I'm Chuck Wessner from the uh, National Academy of Sciences. Uh, very appreciative of your remarks. It's inspiring. In fact, so inspiring. I'd have two questions, perhaps. Uh, can you make more of an effort uh, than is being made? You know, the National Manufacturing Initiative is very impressive. But can you put more resources? I realize you're running into headwinds there, but still. Um, some of the existing programs, you want to move MEP up 25 million. You know, there's a country to the north, not exactly East Asian, uh, which where a conservative government has doubled the IRAP program to 228 million. We're at 123. They're 10 times, large, 10 times smaller in population and economy. Uh, that's without talking about the Fraunhofer's or others where we're really outgunned. So my question is, can you, yes, you're in the right direction. Can you really gear this up to make a difference and can you do it quickly before the time runs out? Yes, uh, as someone who works extensively in rural parts of the country, uh, we're pretty excited about the opportunities in the bioeconomy. Yep. Uh, in, in fact, I would say if the graduate were updated, the word that ought to be whispered to Dustin Hoffman is bioplastics. <laughs> so uh, could you maybe address that issue a little bit in the opportunities? Thanks. Yep. Um, so let me, uh, uh, l I'll start with yours, and actually your, uh, um, I'm glad you mentioned it because you know, one of the interesting things is, you know, at the NEC, we run manufacturing policy. We actually have also an office of kind of manufacturing that we co-chair with Commerce. But a critical player in our manufacturing process is Tom Vilsack and uh, uh, the Department of Agriculture. And we, uh, and, and it was uh, in my written text but not, I, I didn't mention it, but we are absolutely where you are, and you have a Secretary of Agriculture who has made this point uh, uh, very well, and it may not be, maybe in the past, the Secretary of Agriculture wasn't part of the manufacturing policy process, but I will tell you in ours, he is, he's absolutely integral. So uh, we're very aware of that, and we are also you know, looking for policy, uh, uh, you know, how to expand that policy, and, and he's very personally uh, committed to that, and I'm going to give him the plastics line, uh, but I'm going to credit it to me. Um, uh, so um, on the resources, well, uh, let me make a couple of points. I mean, I think that we uh, operate, we try to operate, I think, in a, in a parallel process with, with our priorities, which is we have a very robust legislative agenda, uh, but then we also say to ourselves, if we can't get something passed through Congress, we can't just call it a day. We have to look for what we can do. I think if you look at our legislative agenda, it is quite robust in the resources. I think that um, uh, there's a very strong research budget in manufacturing, clean energy manufacturing, very strong, uh, that we're fighting for constantly. Uh, it's not that it's not in our budget, it's about getting it passed. We, uh, our manufacturing uh, initiative was a billion dollars uh, to do 15 manufacturing initiative. We also have, uh, uh, you know, deployment community initiative that has some bipartisan uh, support uh, that would, you know, that's a couple of billion dollars. Um, so uh, uh, I think that if you added up the dollars in the initiatives, we have, we have a decent amount. Uh, I think the problem that we have is that we just have not had uh, a bipartisan willingness to look at something that should be as uncontroversial as how to have a stronger advanced manufacturing base. I will say there is some bipartisan uh, hope I've seen in the Senate, 
and I do think when you look at the businesses and the communities, there is support, but, uh, uh, but this is, is a challenge. And obviously right now, uh, a perfect example is uh, this is another reflection of the complete idiocy of the sequester. Um, you know, I, I don't find uh, that there's a big difference between Democrats and Republicans in wanting to have a strong manufacturing base in their state, et cetera, and yet you've got this meat axe approach that is uh, cutting, cutting at a time, as you say, where our competitors are investing more, and we're just disarming when we allow that to happen. So that is very, you know, so that is a, a case we will be making. Uh, the president is again uh, going to do a series of speeches where he's going to try to get out of some of that manufactured budget crisis and wars and talk so that we can actually have these type of conversations about what is actually the end goal of our public policy. What do we need to do to make us a magnet for middle class and manufacturing jobs? Now that said, uh, you know, the, the manufacturing innovation hubs is a good example of how you try to make progress even if you can't get new legislation. Uh, the president asked uh, us if he thought we could get legislation in 2012. When we said no, he said, can't we at least do a pilot project? Jason Miller and I went around passing the hat from agency to agency and came up with 40, 45 million, which allowed just one pilot. But that one pilot, when it's tangible in Youngstown with Carnegie Mellon, Case Western, has just created enormous amount of interest, not just in academic and manufacturing circles, but in the Congress now. And now we came back and we're doing three more with existing resources for a total of 200 million. And our phone is ringing with people asking, what could they do to compete for one? So I guess what I would say is we need those resources. We will make that case. We need more bipartisan support for doing that. But in the absence of that, we're going to look for every way we can make progress. So the investing and manufacturing partnership needs resources. But if it doesn't get the resources, we're still going to create that coordinated government approach that allows uh, communities to have a supply chain strategy. Uh, we're going to try to get the billion for manufacturing innovation hubs. If we can't, we're going to keep expanding with, innovate, with, with existing resources. And as people see more success, we believe we will create more demand. Okay, I think we have, let's see the hands up. Let's see how many we have. I think we have time for just three questions before I know that Jean needs to leave. So we'll go with Antoine here in the front row and this person on the side. As you mentioned, we have in manufacturing a skills gap. You're trying to do things about it with community colleges, etc. Question I have, and economy seems to be divided on seem to be divided on this, is why don't you see wages go up for trained operators uh, in a way that would stimulate this? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Helmut Ludwig from Siemens. Uh, you mentioned the factors for manufacturing resurgence, manufacturing renaissance, traditional ones like energy cost, the closing productivity cost gap with Asian countries. And we strongly believe it. We actually believe that there's a very strong stream of software-driven manufacturing renaissance. And uh, we just actually gave a grant, a software grant, to Youngstown State University of yes. 140 million US dollars because we strongly believe that there's, there's an incredible opportunity. Still, I get asked more and more, Helmut, you talk so much about manufacturing renaissance. When is it really picking up? Question to you, what's holding us still back? Hi, I'm Brandon Katz. I'm an intern with the Brookings Institute and also a senior at the University of Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as, I can, as I'm ending out my undergraduate career, uh, this is the fourth year that tuition has continued to raise. And uh, I continue to ask myself how middle class and lower class families are able to attend these four year universities um, and get a desk job in the future with a unsecure uh, job career. So my real question is, um, how do we um, tackle education reform in dealing with like STEM job encouragement and focusing on the manufacturing sector um, supply chain to encourage that innovation and spark that renaissance um, if we're just focusing on an elitist-based institution with making college so inaccessible to so many Americans. All right, I'll, I'll start in reverse order. Um, 
he really wanted to ask me uh, what his senior year in the post Denard Robinson era would be at in Michigan. <laughs> but he feels pretty good about Gardner, so he's, he decided he'd ask something that would not get him embarrassed in front of his fellow research assistants. Um, you are a man of the president's heart because he is focused like this, like a laser beam. Um, you know, we just reached, we just passed the student loan interest uh, compromise yesterday, uh, which will keep the Stafford unsubsidized subsidized at 3.84 for this year. It will be very good. But the president made very clear as he talked to members that this to him was a temporary measure and that you and that we need to be taking a broader look that you can't just be looking at the financial aid component it's an important component we fight for it we prioritize it but if you're not looking at the general college cost issue you're only getting part of the picture uh, so i think this is a very serious issue and i think we are looking at what we can do to first of all empower students with more information uh, uh, you know, he's taught a college scorecard. Uh, a more informed consumers who make choices based on price and quality will enforce competition. There is room for more innovation. Uh, since I'm in an economic uh, uh, environment here, I'll say, I don't think the Baumol's disease for education, you know, makes as much sense in a world of technology, MOOCs, uh, all the new forms of competition. And I think it's a bit of a cop-out for people to suggest that there's not ways of delivering more value uh, uh, at, a, at a lower cost with all of the technology uh, revolution that we're, that we're going uh, at. And, uh, you know, a lot more discussion about are you, you know, paying for performance in when we're doing our financial aid. So I think this is a really important issue. I think it's one the president's very focused on, and I think it's one uh, you'll hear him talk more about in the next couple of months. Um, so on, uh, so first of all, um, uh, uh, on the, the point from the gentleman uh, from Siemens, uh, first of all, I think your point is very well taken. I tried to actually, uh, did try to do the connection on, on the software, but, it, but making the point more on the competitiveness, I think that's important and, and, and a good note and good add um, for us. I think that, uh, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for um, your support. Uh, uh, for the uh, at Youngstown and the software donation, it was noted and greatly appreciated. And obviously, I think some of the federal money that we have spent, uh, you've been partners with on some of the community colleges on, and have been well used. In terms of, you know, is there uh, on the Renaissance happening yet? Uh, you know, again, I still believe that. Uh, that as you look right now, there is good evidence. I mean, there was the, the amount of, of uh, cases of people moving production back to the United States, uh, expanding production in the United States. Uh, the fact that even with, you, you know, you can look at the export slowdown in one or two ways. You could say, well, you know, the job growth hasn't been as good in the last 12 months. But I guess what I would say is, uh, we haven't created 500,000 jobs like this uh, since the 90s. We were growing at a very fast pace there. Uh, so now we have, we're coming out of the worst financial crisis. Our main export partners are growing slow, and we're still up 500,000 jobs, which we have not been uh, in probably close to 20 uh, or, you know, or, or at least, you know, 15 years. Uh, so I think, you know, that, the share of exports, all the things we're talking about, makes me believe that uh, even from a snapshot perspective, things are, are, are going well. But I do believe that policy matters. And that's why, uh, you know, when somebody says, are you having, you know, is there a renaissance by just looking at things right now? It just is the wrong question. The wrong question is, can we? Can we? Is it possible? And, and I'll, I'll say that, you know, uh, uh, you know when, I, when my book came out, Pro Growth Progressive, in 05, 06, that was probably the toughest time. You're going out, you're making a lot of these arguments, you're going places that just the overwhelming trend is shifting location to India, China a bit. Um, so you felt like you were making good arguments, but the wind was in your face. Uh, you know, eight years later, I feel like the wind is at our back. And, and like a lot of things in life, 
uh, good things happen when you seize opportunity, when you have a trend going your way and you seize and you expand on it. And I think that is the real question for us. On the skills gap issue, um, I think it's, it's been a real frustration for us that everybody, you know, that CEOs come in and talk to us about this. This seems like such a bipartisan, non-political issue, and yet you go through the normal budget cycles here again, and people instead, and this is why the president is lifting up and talking about the big policy issues, because everything becomes like a number, uh, an arcane budget issue, instead of us actually having a conversation about the fact that there is a broad consensus in the United States right now that we should be doing more uh, uh, on the skill side. We should be doing more, obviously, in the education side, getting more disadvantaged young people who are talented to go to the best schools uh, that they're eligible for, get increasing the pool, uh, making, creating more opportunities for people who want uh, education or redesign high school experiences that are more tailored to a particular industry, uh, having a system with community colleges of, that work in really close coordination with intermediaries, the private sector, to make sure they're filling local uh, skill needs. And I think there's a lot of agreement on this. Uh, I think we have examples. I think you're, the Siemens North Carolina Community College is a good example of something working like that. Uh, but, uh, and, and we're putting a big focus on this now, but we propose $8 billion career to community college initiative that goes right at this. Everybody seems to like it. It doesn't even get a hearing. So again, this is an area where we're just, we are going to be looking for what we can do with our existing resources, even if we have to kind of pilot and just show best case successes to try to create more demand. On the, um, the skills gap issue, you raise an interesting issue, and I don't have a great answer to it, which is that virtually everywhere you go, um, you hear people having difficulty hiring welders, hiring uh, certain high-skilled jobs uh, that make it clear that there are some areas where we are having skill gaps and we need to address them. But it is the point that a lot of our top labor economists look and say, why aren't the wages going up more for those? And uh, that does seem to be a puzzle from what you hear and see and some of the data. And I don't know if things are just a little out of date and those will match up, but it is an interesting question that you know, Larry Katz and others have, uh, have raised, you know, with me. So it's a good, it's a good question for this, this uh, institution to look at. 